Hello everyone, welcome to the Spoke of Greats podcast. Today we're going to be reading through Meditations by Marcus Aurelius. Specifically, I'm going to walk you through book three, how to read it and what lessons we can take from it. During this session, I'm going to be drinking Tenute Tierra Lisi Rosso Piceno from 2020. Rosso Piceno is a blend from the Marche region in northeast Italy, which is a blend of Montepulciano and Sangiovese. I would say this is a pretty decent midweek drinking Italian red. And I think the the mix with the Montepulciano softens out some of the harsher tannins, which you might normally get from a Sangiovese. I got this one from the Wine Society. Let me know if you've tried a, a Marche wine before or specifically a, a Rosso Piceno. Cheers. Mm. Yeah, so I'm getting a hint of sour cherry there and there's a little bit of sour cherry and plum but very easy drinking i had a glass of this with some hot dogs yesterday went down a treat please let me know in the comments what you'll be drinking today as we move on with book three if you want to follow along with the version that i'm reading today i'm reading the penguin classics version which you can purchase off amazon i'll provide a link in the description to a free version of meditations that you can read it will have slightly different language to the version i'm reading but you'll get the same gist book three was written in carnuntum carnuntum was a fortress in what would now no be known as Austria. Uh, at the time would have been called Pannonia. As I've talked about before, Marcus Aurelius writes meditations whilst on a military campaign fighting against the Quadi in that kind of Bohemia region. So that's the context of where he's writing this now. He's been spending about the last 10 years or so fighting wars. We must take into our reckoning not only that life is expended day by day and the remaining balance diminishes, but also this further consideration. If we live longer, there is no guarantee that our mind will likewise retain that power to comprehend and study the world which contributes to our experience of things divine and human. If dementia sets in, there will be no failure of such faculties as breathing, feeding, imagination, desire. Before these go, the earlier extinction is of one's proper use of one's self. One's accurate assessment of the gradations of duty, one's ability to analyse impressions, one's understanding of whether the time has come to leave this life. These and all other matters which wholly depend on trained calculation. So we must have a sense of urgency, not only for the ever closer approach of death, but also because our comprehension of the world and our ability to pay proper attention will fade before we do. So Marcus here is talking about the deterioration of the mind. As time goes on, we start to slow down. Our brains can't process things in the same way that we used to. Quite simply, it's like a computer filling up the RAM. You've got your hard drives full of stuff, and so it takes you a lot longer to process things. And we often think about mortality and hoping that we live a long life. And then the question has to beg, what sort of life are we living if we're not aware of our surroundings, if we don't have our faculties about us? Are we enjoying life in the same way? And this is why making the most of the time you have is so precious. In the same way, it's important to exercise whilst we have the gift of a body that can perform phys physical activity. It's also important to exercise the mind. And so if you have your faculties about you, it's a case of use it or lose it. We should also attend to things like these, observing that even the incidental effects of the process of nature have their own charm and attraction. Take the baking of bread. The loaf splits open here and there, and those very cracks, in one way a failure of the baker's profession, somehow catch the eye and give particular stimulus to our appetite. Figs likewise burst open at full maturity. And in olives, ripened on the tree, the very proximity of decay lends a special beauty to the fruit. Similarly, the ears of corn nodding down to the ground, the lion's puckered brow, the foam gushing from the boar's mouth, 
and much else besides. Looked at in isolation, these things are far from lovely, but their consequence on the process of nature enhances them and gives them attraction. So any man with a feeling and deeper insight for the workings of the whole will find some pleasure in almost every aspect of their disposition, including the incidental consequences. So here Marcus is talking really about mindfulness, appreciating the small aspects of life. You may be wondering why every podcast I start, I get a glass of wine out and talk a little bit about it and try and taste it. It's partly for my own selfish reasons. I enjoy drinking wine and I like sharing some knowledge on it. But going through the process of tasting wine, it makes you slow down for a second and look at the smaller details. Normally, when we're drinking alcohol, we'll just take a quick gulp and we're doing it to get drunk. When going through the process of tasting wine, it might seem like a waste of time. Oh, this is just some pretentious activity to show off or whatever. And you should just drink the wine, get it down you. It makes no difference. And you'd actually save a lot of time if you just did that. I would put it the other way that time will go by a lot slower if you take notice of the things around you. Do you ever have that moment where you've made yourself a coffee or a tea and you go over to the cup to drink it and then you realise that you actually drank it five minutes ago? you'd totally forgotten that you, you drank it. Your brain has totally removed that experience of drinking coffee five minutes ago, as if it never happened. And you're now five minutes into the future, wondering where that time went. And this is the power of mindfulness, of being present in the moment. It allows you to take stock of your surroundings, of your experience and when you notice things you are exposed more to the experience of consciousness and so by smelling the wine feeling the texture in in your mouth seeing what flavors you can detect or what does it remind you of you're being present in in the moment and you're taking a second to enjoy the, the current moment. And I think that's something very powerful. We're often so hooked up on passing from one thing to the next. Yep, yep, get that over, complete, next thing. That we don't take stock of what we're doing in the moment. We don't take time to enjoy or appreciate whatever it is that we're currently doing. And let's say we're working towards our goals, we're trying to make a lot of money or get a promotion or buy a new car. Enjoying your morning cup of coffee is necessary before you can eventually appreciate a sports car. If you can't appreciate the small things, the likelihood that you will later on appreciate the big things is rather small. So any man with a feeling and deeper insight for the workings of the whole will find some pleasure in almost every aspect of their disposition, including the incidental consequences. Such a man will take no less delight in the living snarl of wild animals than in all the imitative representations of painters and sculptors. He will see a kind of bloom and fresh beauty in an old woman or an old man, and he will be able to look with sober eyes on the seductive charm of his own slave boys. Not all can share this conviction. Only one who has developed a genuine affinity for nature and her works for him, there will be many such perceptions. There's a great exercise in mindfulness which you can practice. I like to do this sometimes. I will just look at any random object in my house and I'll just think a second about what had to happen for that to get to where it is now. And you may be thinking, What's he talking about? You go to the shop, you buy it, that's it. But how did it get to the shop? And maybe it was at a warehouse before then, and then it was at a factory. And then where did all the materials come from? And all the people 
who process the transporting of it, the taxation, the standardization to match the size of a cup, the designers, the manufacturers, the sales department. All of these people coordinated together to get this coaster into my house, which is such a bizarre chain of events, really. When you can find the large in the small, meaning that you can pick any object and it might seem boring, but then once you start to unravel what was behind it, you find a lot of interesting things. So give it a go. Pick a random object in your house and just have a think for five minutes about the whole process from extracting the raw materials right down to arriving at your house and all the processes that have gone on there. There's a fantastic experiment on YouTube this guy did where he tried to make a chicken sandwich from scratch. So everything from scratch. So raising the chicken, killing it, sourcing the meat, growing the wheat to make flour, to make bread. And the whole process from start to finish took about six months and cost him $1,800. And it just hits home the miracle of modern society of what can be achieved on scale when people collaborate. And we only ever see a small part of the picture. Our day-to-day lives are surrounded by everyone else's contributions to that small picture. From the clothes we wear, to the roads we drive on, to the cars we drive. And everything all along that process. You can find small hidden details which we take for granted and we don't notice. And it's only when you slow down and look around and look deeper not just a first glance, that you actually realise that the world is far more interesting than we give it credit. Hippocrates cured many diseases, then died of disease himself. The Chaldean astrologers foretold the deaths of many people, then their own fated day claimed them. Alexander, Pompey, Julius Caesar annihilated whole cities time after time, and slaughtered tens of thousands of horse and foot in the field of battle. And yet the moment came for them too to depart this life. Heracles speculated long on the conflagration of the universe, but the water of dropsy filled his guts, and he died caked in the poultice of cow dung. Vermin were the death of Democritus, and vermin of another sort killed Socrates. What of it then? You embarked, you set sail, you made port. Go ashore now. If it is to another life, nothing is empty of the gods, even on that shore. And if to insensibility you will cease to suffer pains and pleasures, no longer in thrall to a bodily vessel, which is a master as far inferior as its servant is superior. One is mind and divinity, the other a clay of dust and blood. Marcus here is reminding us of the transience of life. Many great people have lived before us. They've had very consequential lives and large impacts, or so it seems. And yet they've all suffered the same fate. From the lowest to the highest of society, death is a fate shared by all of us. And thus, something which has done, been done billions of times before can't be that big a deal. It's nothing to fear. It's just another step in the journey. And Marcus here finishes off this paragraph with the point that either there's an afterlife, at which point you'll be with the gods, so that's great. And if there's nothing, you won't be aware of it anyway. Either outcome's fine. You've got nothing to lose. Do not waste the remaining part of your life in thoughts about other people when you are not thinking with reference to some aspect of the common good. Why deprive yourself at the time for some other task? Thinking about what so-and-so is doing, and why what he is saying or contemplating or plotting, and all that line of thought, makes you stray from the close watch on your own directing mind. We spend a good portion of our lives concerned with the thoughts of other people and what they may think of us. This is the spotlight effect in action, 
the idea that we are the main character we are the protagonist in this movie and everyone else is an extra coordinating their lives in response to what we do the issue with that is that the other seven and a half billion people on this planet think exactly the same hence they're really not thinking about you as much as you think they are this is that classic scenario where if you trip over in the street internally your brain is full of oh god how embarrassing and yet if you were to watch someone else trip in the street you'd go oh they've tripped okay and then you get on with your life you don't think about it again whereas if you just tripped that's the end of your day ah what an idiot in the same way no one's going to think about a coffee stain on your shirt as much as you will someone might notice oh look guess they spilled some coffee I always find this hilarious and I'm guilty of this myself you ever walk down the street and then you realize you're going the wrong direction but you can't just turn around because that would be mental so you get your phone out and look at your phone to make it seem as if you've checked something which has made you decide to go in the opposite direction as if it's all part of some deliberate act because you can't possibly just do a 180 in the street And we put on this pantomime for other people, and yet no one is observing this. And if you were to observe it, you would just assume, oh, I guess they were going the wrong way, and now they've turned back. No one is giving any more thought to it. And yet we are constantly second-guessing our our actions to seek the approval of others. This is where we may play down our interests or put an act on to appear in a positive light to people. But we're living a lie. And to then look back retrospectively and think, was I lying or pretending to be someone I'm not just to get the approval of others? It's it's a pretty sad thing to to think about. It's better to live to who you really are than to be popular. Generally, you'll find three groups of people. You'll get enemies, people who will hate you no matter what you do. You could cure cancer and they would complain about how you've made doctors unemployed. You've got your cheerleaders. These are people who will support you no matter what you do. These are your loyal friends. And then you have a lot of people in the middle who don't really care either way. And maybe they'll be influenced by what you do. Knowing the fact that there are people who will not like you no matter what you do or what you change, should be a liberating not to care for the opinions of others or equally what they're doing in their life. Whether a celebrity has had an affair or a politician has some, said something controversial on Twitter, we still have a job to do. We still have our own responsibilities to attend to. That does not change. And these things are just a distraction. No. In the sequence of your thoughts, you must avoid all that is casual or aimless, and most particularly, anything prying or malicious. Train yourself to think only those thoughts such that in answer to the sudden question, what is in your mind now? You could say with immediate frankness, whatever it is, this or that. Or so your answer can give direct evidence that all your thoughts are straightforward and kindly, the thoughts of a social being who has no regard for the fancies of pleasure or wider indulgence, for rivalry, malice, suspicion, or anything else that one would blush to admit was in one's mind. So the Stoics believed in being true to oneself and living in such a way as to have no need for secrets. If you have no shame of what it is that you're doing, then there's no need to hide it. Stoics are setting a high standard here, aren't they? We have intrusive thoughts that we would not dream of sharing with someone else. And to a certain extent, we are not in control of our thoughts. You ever get that random song stuck in your head that you can't get out? Or you're going through an experience over and over in your head? We can't choose for these things to not appear in our head what we can choose is what we pay attention to you can choose to notice something 
acknowledge it's there and let it pass. I believe that that is the extent to which we are in control of our minds. We can acknowledge a thought, acknowledge that we are thinking of something, how it makes us feel, and then let it go. But we can't repress thoughts. And I think that's probably why he mentions about distractions and the directing mind in the previous passage is that by focusing on something, we can direct our attention to our purpose, our wider goals, as opposed to aimless action. A man such as this, if he postpones no longer his ready place among the best, is in some way a priest and minister of the gods. He responds to the divinity seated within him, and this renders the man unsullied by pleasures, unscathed by any pain, untouched by any wrong, unconscious of any wickedness, a wrestler for the greatest prize of all, to avoid being thrown by any passion, died to the core with justice, embracing with his whole heart all the experience allotted to him, rarely and only when there is great need for the common good, wondering what others may be saying or doing or thinking. He has only his own work to bring to fulfilment, and only his own fated allocation from the whole to claim his constant attention. As for his work, he makes it excellent. As for his lot, he is convinced it is good, and each person's appointed lot is both his fellow passenger and his driver. So here Marcus is talking about being unaffected by pain or pleasure. Easier said than done, these things can hijack our mood, but it's worth remembering how fleeting a lot of these experiences are. If you think about watching a sporting event, when your team or player scores a point, you have this moment of elation. But think of the split second at that last, maybe at tops it's 30 seconds, and then you mellow back down again, back to your baseline. Similarly, when you're in traffic and someone cuts you off, you have a fit of rage for a few seconds, and then you're back to your baseline. You can't force yourself to be elated for any longer than the event which affects you. In the same way, you can't force yourself to be angry for a second any longer. So when you appreciate that these things are very fleeting, it's maybe advisable to be suspicious of them. Or at least that's what the Stoics would say. When we think about pain, we often think that pain is intolerable, unbearable. Pain is something which you experience in the present moment, and every second that present moment has gone. It's just gone again and again. And so, by very definition, in that moment, you have tolerated that pain. What your fear is of that future pain. In the same way with pleasure, our brain is wired to pursue pleasure. And it's not the fulfillment that drives us, but rather the pursuit. And so with both of these things, we are preoccupied with the future and not taking stock of our present circumstances. And here Marcus is advocating for the pursuit of excellence in one's own work, whatever it may happen to be. And he makes no judgment on the differences in people's work but rather their duty. So if you're going to be a shopkeeper, then be a good shopkeeper. If you're going to be an IT consultant, be a good IT consultant. If you're going to be a general, be a good general. If you're going to be a bartender, be a good bartender. Whatever it is you may happen to be, do your best to be good at it. I think it was Jordan Peterson who talked about there being no job which is too menial or too insignificant to create a little piece of hell. And he talks about the the breakfast from hell. So you go to this diner and the coffee's cold and 
the bacon's like raw in parts and overcooked in others and the potatoes have been left in the fryer for several days and you add all these different things in to create a horrible experience and then obviously everyone who will go into that place to have breakfast is having a terrible start to the day and that's having a knock-on effect we can easily think sometimes that we're not important enough to have an impact but we can have a disproportionate impact on the lives of the people we encounter positively or negatively you could get onto public transport and get blackout drunk and start vomiting on people and shouting and swearing and you've ruined the journey home of several hundred people and then when they get in they'll probably have an argument with their family or whatever the knock-on consequences of that one action is disproportionate in the same way you could you could make someone's day through an act of kindness you could, or just a simple act of smiling at someone or talking to them and that could change the whole trajectory of their day and so taking whatever it is that you've been given in life and trying to be good at it is a noble pursuit to follow he bears in mind too the kinship of all rational beings and that caring for all men is in accordance with man's nature but that nevertheless he should not hold to the opinions of all but only of those who live their lives in agreement with he will constantly remind himself what sort of people they are who do not lead such lives what they are like both at home and abroad by night and by day they and the polluting company they keep so he disregards even the praise of such men these are people who are not even satisfied with themselves this is one to bear in mind when we're preoccupied with what people think of us and then question is that person's opinion something we should really value if they're not even happy with their own life of course they're not going to support or advocate for the way someone else's life is going because it, it's clouded their judgment and if you examine the life of someone who is hostile to you or critical of you and you don't agree with their judgment ask yourself do you need the advice of someone whose life you would not like to live you can perhaps take it as a token of what not to do but that's as far as you should pay attention you should take no action unwinningly selfishly uncritically or with conflicting motives do not dress up your thoughts in smart finery. Do not be a gabbler or a meddler. Further, let the God that is within you be the champion of the being you are, a male, mature in years, a statesman, a Roman, a ruler, one who has taken his post like a soldier waiting for the retreat from life to sound and ready to depart past the need for any loyal oath or human witness and see that you keep a cheerful demeanor and retain your independence of outside help and the peace which others can give your duty is to stand straight not held straight so here this sense of duty is coming out strong for marcus as he didn't really want to be emperor but he finds himself in his position and so well i don't want to be emperor but if I am going to be emperor, I'm going to be a good one. I'm going to do my duty and make sure that the lives of others is better as a result of it, that the empire is secure. And so he sees himself on the frontier of the empire, waging war against the Quadi in Pannonia. And he sees no reason why to complain about that it's his duty and he doesn't see the need for depicting things in a fancy way using needlessly complicated language or dressing in fine clothes all of his aim is towards fulfilling his duty and he doesn't need to do it with fanfare he doesn't need to tell other people hey look what i'm doing the fact that he knows what he's doing is reward enough and he doesn't need the acknowledgement of others 
either with praise or criticism, it would not change his commitment to duty. If you discover in human life something better than justice, truth, self-control, courage, in short, something better than the self-sufficiency of your own mind, which keeps you acting in accord with true reason and accepts your inheritance of fate in all outside your choice. If, as I say, you can see something better than this, then turn to it with all your heart and enjoy this prime good you have found. But if nothing is shown to be better than the very God that is seated in you, which has brought all your impulses under its control, which scrutinises your faults, which has withdrawn itself, as Socrates used to say, from all the inducements of the senses, which has subordinated itself to the gods and takes care for men. If you find all else by comparison with this small and paltry, then give no room to anything else. Once turned and inclined to any alternative, you will struggle thereafter to restore the primacy of that good which is yours and yours alone. Here Marcus is talking about the Stoic virtues. We have courage, and that comes in the form of physical courage, not giving in to self-preservation and overly concerned about your safety in when you have a duty to perform. This could be, for example, in his context, whilst waging war, courageous in battle, and in moral courage. So not being deterred by others or swayed by the crowd. And then we have self-control, also known as temperance. So this is the moderation of pleasures. It's worth remembering that Marcus Aurelius was emperor, so he had access to anything he wanted. All the riches, all the women, the food, the wine. Unlimited access to anything he wanted. The exercise of temperance was probably one of the hardest virtues to uphold in terms of stoicism especially when you look how a lot of the other emperors acted during the batshit crazy reigns like one big orgy because it is not right that the rational and social good should be rivaled by anything of a different order For example, the praise of the many, or power, or wealth, or the enjoyment of pleasure. All these things may seem to suit for a little while, but they can suddenly take control and carry you away. So you, I repeat, must simply and freely choose the better and hold to it. But better is what benefits. If to your benefit as a rational being, adopt it. But if simply to your benefit as an animal, reject it and stick to your judgment without fanfare. Only make sure that your scrutiny is sound. So again, he's talking about not making a noise about doing the right thing. You can do the right thing without preaching to others about, oh, look how such a great person I am. Haven't I done this wonderful thing? You can make the right choice for lunch today. You had a a light chicken salad instead of a pizza. The results will speak for themselves. You don't need to preach to other people how they should eat or what it is a great thing that you're doing. And diet is a good example there where what is good for you in the moment may not be good for you in the future. So a donut is very pleasurable to eat at the moment over a longer time frame is probably not the best thing for your arteries and so having that awareness of the bigger picture is important in your actions am i doing this right now because it's convenient to me and it feels good or is it actually good for me i noticed there there is a difference there you think of it as like looking after a child it's necessary to do things sometimes which the child doesn't want you to do Maybe you need to get the child vaccinated or you need to take them to the dentist and they don't want to go. Well, that it's in their best interests and that is going to conflict with their likes and dislikes in the present moment, but it overall is good for them. And it's no different with yourself. Never regard as a benefit to yourself anything which will force you at some point to break your faith, to leave integrity behind, to hate, suspect, or curse another. 
to dissemble, to covet anything needing the secrecy of walls and drapes. A man who has put first his own mind and divinity, and worships the supremacy of the God within him, makes no drama of his life, no hand-wringing, no craving for solitude or crowds. Most of all, his will be a life of neither pursuit nor avoidance. It is of no remote concern to him whether he will retain the bodily envelope of his soul for a longer or a shorter time. Even if release must come here and now, he will depart as easily as he would any other act that admits of integrity and decency. Throughout all his life, his one precaution is that his mind should not shift to a state without affinity to a rational and social being. So this passage talks about the importance of integrity and being true to yourself. And as we were talking earlier about having no shame in sharing your thoughts, again, there's this idea of being able to do everything out in the open. So you shouldn't need to hide anything. And the question is that if what you're doing needs hiding, is it good for you? You could do something for money or popularity. It might seem expedient or convenient to do, but is it in accordance with who you really are or have you sold out? And interesting on this point of no craving for solitude or crowds. So there's a tendency in philosophy to this idea of retreating to your compound, going to your hermit cave and withdrawing from society. And that's not what the Stoics believed. The Stoics believed that you have a duty to the rest of humanity, to society. That means you need to engage with society. They don't agree with following what the crowd does, but nor do they agree with being isolationist and detached from society. And this is why he mentions here craving neither solitude nor the crowd. You should be comfortable in any circumstance because your mind is available to you, whether you're alone or in a crowd, you always have your mind with you. And it's possible to maintain peace of mind on a noisy construction site just as much as it is by a calm lake. And he's talking about remaining rational and is reminding himself again that death is part of this natural journey and whether it comes tomorrow or in 20 years he will meet that duty just the same i'm often reminded here of gandalf's quote in lord of the rings that a wizard is neither late nor early he arrives exactly when he intends to I think this is the Stoic attitude to death, really. Sometimes people get the wrong impression that if the Stoics talk so much about death, they must really love it, and that surely it must be a good thing to commit suicide and just die now. The Stoics don't view it that way. They see death as a natural process, which we all must fulfil, but that when the time is right, that means not leaving too early nor too late. So not throwing away your life needlessly, but also not prolonging your life beyond the point of dignity if your life was to go against all of your principles or you were losing all of your faculties, then the Stoics would argue that you have lived past your time at that point as well. So it's always about the appropriate time for things, neither too late, neither too early exactly when they're supposed to be. In the mind of one who is chastened and cleansed, you will find no separation, no simmering ulcer, no sore festering under the skin. Fate does not catch him with his life unfulfilled, as one might speak of an actor leaving the stage before his part is finished and the play is over. Moreover, you will find nothing servile or pretentious, no dependence or alienation, nothing to answer for, no lurking fault. So here Marcus is explaining that the reward of being a good person is that you live in peace. You have no lingering voice in the back of your head. What if thing I did or secret is discovered? Or what if someone will seek revenge on me? You're not full of hatred for someone else. You're not living behind a mask 
and trying to live up to an idea that other people have of you. You're also making the most of the time you have so that if you were to leave tomorrow, you would be happy to leave because you've made the most of the time you have. And that the root of all this is no regrets. Revere your power of judgment. All rests on this to make sure that your directing mind no longer entertains any judgment which fails to agree with the nature or the constitution of a rational being. And this state guarantees deliberate thought, affinity with other men, and obedience to the gods. Your judgment of things will determine reality, at least according to you. And so it's very important to pay attention to your judgments. If you determine that something is good or bad, then you will believe that it is good or bad. If you believe that this is a very terrible thing that has happened to you and you can't recover, or that you believe that this is just a minor setback, I can learn from this, whichever way you think, you're right. That is ultimately how you will then act. Our thoughts determine our actions. So discard all else and secure these few things only. And remind yourself too that each of us lives only in the present moment, a mere fragment of time. The rest is life past or uncertain future. Sure, life is a small thing and small the cranny of the earth in which we live it. Small too even the longest fame thereafter which is itself subject to a succession of little men who will quickly die and have no knowledge even of themselves, let alone of those long dead. So Marcus touched on this in book two as well, if you remember that episode. The only thing we have control of is the present moment, because the past is already gone, we can't alter the past, and we don't know what will happen in the future. To a certain extent, the future is determined by what we do right now in this current moment and the one after that and so on and so forth and this is why i talked at the be- and this is why i talked at the beginning about mindfulness and placing yourself in the current moment putting your feet on the ground looking at the sensations that are going on in your body paying attention to them what are you thinking about what do you feel right now Notice the small things. It's that presence of mind which allows you to direct your attention to the things that you want to pay attention to. And it's only through being mindful that you can make the most of this time, which is so fleeting to us. Existence is so brief when we think about all the people that have lived and died and have been forgotten about. One addition to the precepts already mentioned, always make a definition or sketch of what presents itself to your mind, so you can see it stripped bare to its essential nature, and identify it clearly, in whole, and in all its parts, and can tell yourself its proper name, and the names of those elements of which it is compounded, and into which it will be dissolved. This is a powerful exercise you can do when you're feeling overwhelmed by things. If you break things down into their integral parts, into their components, it doesn't seem as big a deal. You can strip things down smaller and smaller. If someone says something hurtful to you, you can strip the language down to it's the mere ordering of words. If you articulate specifically what it is that you feel and not just in a abstract way like I feel pissed off actually ask yourself what are you feeling right now maybe your hands are shaking maybe you're breathing heavier maybe your brow is frowning or you're looking at the floor pay attention to all of these things and describe them what you'll find is often that through description of these component parts the intensity of the feeling is lessened it feels less intense when we put a name to these things 
Nothing is so conducive to greatness of mind as the ability to subject each element of our experience in life to methodical and truthful examination, always at the same time using this scrutiny as a means to reflect on the nature of the universe. The contribution any given action or event makes to that nature and the value it has for man, and man is an inhabitant of this highest city, all of which, other cities, are mere households. Ask then, what is this which is now making its impression on me? What is it composed of? How long in the nature of things will it last? What virtue is needed to meet it? Gentleness, for example, or courage, truthfulness, loyalty, simplicity, self-sufficiency, and so on. And so if you look at things in these components, you can think about what it is. Is it really that big of a deal? What tools do you have available to, to deal with it? So in each case, we must say, this has come from God. This is due to a juncture of fate, the mesh of destiny, or some similar coincidence of chance. And this is from my fellow man, my kinsman and colleague, though one who does not know what accords with his own nature. But I do know, and so I treat him kindly and fairly, following the natural law of our fellowship. But at the same time, I aim to give him his proper desert in matters which are morally neutral. There's that scene in the Bible where Christ says, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. He's referring to the people who have put him to death because they didn't know what the right thing to do was. And in the same way, the Stoics believed that people who had committed bad acts did so because they did not know what the right thing was to do. And it's up to the Stoics to show that person what the right action is. And you can't be mad at someone who doesn't know what the right thing to do is, because they didn't know. They've been led down the path that they were led, and that's all they know. That doesn't mean you can't deliver consequences, though. But to do so in a way that is consistent with the actions that have been delivered. Marcus fought the best part of a 16-year war against the Quadi on the edge of the empire. He wasn't bemoaning the fact that why do these people keep crossing our borders and trying to get into the empire? Rather, he was focused on delivering consequences without worrying about why are these people doing these things or why are these bad things happening to us. It's in the same way when you're, let's say you want a refund on something, you bought something which didn't work. You can get abusive, you can swear, you can curse, but it doesn't change the outcome. You can go through the process of getting a refund or filing a complaint without the added emotion, which doesn't add any further credence to your complaint. If anything, it detracts from you. If you were to call a customer service team and just shout on the phone, it doesn't make it any more likely that you're going to get what it is that you want. It might feel good in the moment to explode your emotions, but it's not going to change your outcome. It will, however, make it a far more unpleasant experience for everyone involved. You could be at a nightclub and a bouncer could say that you're not coming in. With all the reason in the world, you're not going into that club. And what you choose to do next will not change the outcome. What it might change is whether you get punched in the face. If you set yourself to your present task along the path of true reason, with all determination, vigour and goodwill, if you admit no distraction, but to keep your own divinity pure and standing strong, as if you had to surrender it right now, if you grapple this to you, expecting nothing, shirking nothing, but self-content with each present action taken in accordance with nature, and a heroic truthfulness in all that you say and mean, then you will lead a good life, and nobody is able to stop you. So Marcus here is talking about staying focused on 
what it is that you aim to do. Take no notice of distractions. If you have a goal in life, you've determined a purpose that you've set yourself upon. Everything else is a sideshow to that. It's a distraction. The more distraction you admit into your life, that is pulling you away from that path. And if you're self-content with the present moment, then you have mastered your perception of time because the present moment is what we have available to us. It's the only thing we have available to us. So if you control the present moment, you control your time. Just as doctors always have their instruments and knives at hand for any emergency treatment, so you should have your doctrines ready for the recognition of the divine and the human and the performance of every action, even the smallest, in consciousness of the bond which unites the two, no action in the human context will succeed without reference to the divine, nor vice versa. So here he's talking about the power of the mind and acting in accordance with your true self, your inner nature, if you will. This is something that is available to you at any time, regardless of the circumstance. You could be in a horrific accident and become paralysed. You could be imprisoned for the rest of your life or be infected by sickness. None of these things prevent you from accessing your inner self and making sure that you are judging things in accordance with that inner self. No more wandering. You are not likely to read your own jottings, your histories of the ancient Greeks and Romans, your extracts from their literature laid up for your old age. Hurry then to the end. Abandon vain hopes. Rescue yourself. If you have any care for yourself while the opportunity is still there. So he's reminding himself to take action. I think Marcus was quite the academic and read a lot of writings on ancient history. Remember, by the time of Marcus Aurelius, looking back at someone like Julius Caesar or Augustus would be like us looking back at Abraham Lincoln today. And looking back at someone like Alexander the Great would be the equivalent of us looking back at someone like Henry VIII. These are already distant figures by their own perspective. And Marcus was very interested in his predecessors and their accomplishments and what they did. But he's trying to remind himself that a lot of this knowledge is useless. You can go over the facts of history and go, oh yeah, actually their real name was such and such. Or, oh, actually it was the day after that this happened. But that stuff is the superficial stuff. The real stuff from history is the lesson. What is the takeaway? What is the don't do this because that turned out badly? How can we apply the failures of the past to the present so that the future is a better place? And it's not that he's advocating giving up history, but rather a time comes for taking action. They do not know all the meanings of theft, of sowing, of buying, of keeping at rest, of seeing what needs to be done. This is not for the eye, but for a different sort of vision. So the vision here Marcus is talking about is your moral compass, effectively. It's your rational mind. And Marcus appears to believe that people who lack this faculty are effectively blind because they are aimless. They are not being guided by their moral compass. And you need that rational mind to make proper judgment on things. And this may be different to how things immediately appear to the naked eye. Body, soul, mind. To the body belong sense perceptions to the soul impulses, to the mind judgments. The receipt of sense impressions is shared with cattle. Responses to the puppet strings of impulse is shared with wild beasts, with catamites, with a phalaris or a nero. Having the mind as guide to what appears appropriate action is shared with those who do not believe in the gods, 
those who betray their country, those who get up to anything behind closed doors. So if all else is held in common with the categories mentioned above, it follows that the defining characteristic of the good person is to love and embrace whatever happens to him along his thread of fate, and not to pollute the divinity which is seated within his breast, or trouble it with a welter of confused impressions, but to preserve its constant faith in proper allegiance to God, saying only what is true, doing only what is just. Now I must admit, I struggled understanding this passage. If you have any thoughts in the comments about what Marcus is getting at here, please let me know. The reason it gets confusing for me is because Marcus uses so many different terms and throughout meditations these can be used interchangeably. So here he uses the soul and mind as different things. First of all, I was thinking that perhaps this was something along the lines of what we would imagine today as the reptilian brain, the mammalian brain and the human brain. So if you think of the body just being perceptions like a low level animal and then the soul responding to impulses is like the mammalian brain giving into pleasure and he likens this to the likes of Nero, the infamously bad emperor. But then he also lays out that the rational mind is no better in liking it that people can use this rational mind to commit evil as well. Therefore, there's nothing inherently good or bad in the rational mind. And that the only good thing is amor fati, which would be the love of fate, to accept whatever circumstances happen to come your way because that is the intention of the gods. And he finishes it here with saying only what is true and doing only what is just. He's discarding the need for any externals and just focusing on what is the right thing to do and what is the true thing to say. And if all people mistrust him for living a simple, decent and cheerful life, he has no quarrel with any of them and no diversion from the road which leads to the final goal of his life. To this he must come pure, at peace, ready to depart in unforced harmony with his fate. So finally here Marcus is talking about the acceptance of his own path that he's committed to. It does not matter whether people agree with him or disagree with him, he will not change the, the path that he's, he's on because he's being true to himself and living in harmony with the universe is the path to a good life living free of the judgment of others that's it for today thank you for listening to the spoken greats podcast if you enjoyed this episode please like and subscribe to the channel and look forward to more great ideas from great books see you soon